When we speak, we also hear ourselves speak. I'll propose that what appears at first to be a trivial observation is in fact integral to our interactions with the world around us. According to speech motor and psycholinguistic models, feedback from an auditory stream corresponding to our own voice helps us to control our ongoing vocalizations. There's a problem with this. It assumes we've already worked out how we're able to distinguish the sounds of our own voice from ambient sounds. But we don't have such a system worked out at all. Auditory scene analysis, sometimes referred to as the cocktail party problem, is an ongoing research area. I was interested in the process by which we're able to recognise the sounds of our own voice. Could it happen in the ear? Probably not, but let's have a look more closely. We hear our own voice through two different routes. One is conducted through air around the head and the other is conducted through the neck, sometimes called bone or body conduction. This is why recordings of your speech sound funny. They capture the sound traveling around your head, but not the sound traveling through your neck. So recordings capture only half of what you hear when you're talking. Now the inner ear has distinct sets of mechanoreceptors. The cochlea is a spiral structure in which mechanoreceptors are deflected by ambient sounds. And the vestibular system is a series of chambers with mechanoreceptors deflected by changes in motion. It turns out that vestibular mechanoreceptors are deflected by sound as well as by motion. Air conducted sound coincident on the eardrum doesn't deflect vestibular mechanoreceptors very much at all. But body conducted sound containing a similar amount of energy deflects vestibular mechanoreceptors a lot. So much so, in fact, that there's no doubt that vestibular mechanoreceptors are deflected when we hear ourselves speaking. Let's go back to our problem of how we recognize the sounds of our own voice. Perhaps it can happen through coincidence detection between deflections of cochlea and vestibular mechanoreceptors. That's my first hypothesis, which I'll call H1. There are a couple of ways I think this hypothesis could be tested. One is to research with animal models, but animal testing isn't really my area. So I looked at the other way which is to research groups of people who might misidentify their own speech. Now, I don't have time to go into it here, but I'm pretty sure people who stutter are one such group. So now I have two hypotheses. I'm going to test them at the same time through inference to the best explanation. People who stutter have normal hearing at least as far as the cochlea goes, but we don't know much about their vestibular system. So an obvious starting point was to appraise the vestibular system in people who stutter. There's a standard clinical test, the vestibular evoked myogenic potential, or VEMP, which gives insight into vestibular function. It's actually a test of the vestibular colic reflex. So you put an active electrode onto a neck muscle and a reference on the sternum and record the changing potential across the muscle while you play tone burst stimuli to your participant. The VEMP's a pretty big response and it scales linearly with stimulus level once you've done a log transform of the amplitudes. This means you can do a linear mixed model analysis using repeated measures. I thought this would be a nice way to get a bit more statistical power. I had 15 participants with paired controls. Let's take a look at the results. This is a histogram showing VEMP amplitudes for all participants independent of stimulus level. It's not a statistically valid comparison because it doesn't account for the repeated measures. But you can get an idea of distributions, which seem fairly normal. It also looks like there might be a group difference. Box plots of participants show pairing along with distributions of VEMP amplitude. In nine cases, participants with stuttering have clearly smaller VEMP amplitudes than their pairs. In five cases, there's a partial overlap. 
which will be evaluated in the linear mixed model analysis. Only one participant who stuttered had a clearly larger vamp amplitude than the paired control. Stuttering onset for this participant was at 10 years old and was consistent with psychogenic stuttering. There was also a participant who cluttered among the five having partial overlap. Both of these participants could have been excluded on the basis that they're not typical cases of persistent developmental stuttering. Excluding the participants would have increased group differences. However, both participants were retained. The analysis was conservative. Plotting regression lines of stimulus level versus vamp amplitude for each participant gives an idea of what to expect with a linear mixed model analysis. It's looking like for any stimulus level, the paired controls will have a larger vamp amplitude than participants who stutter. But we need to run the analysis to find out. When we do, we have the statistically significant result that VEMP amplitude is 8.5 decibels smaller in people who stutter than in pairs controls. That's with a fixed slopes model, but results are similar if we allow the slopes to vary. This study had a pilot with five participants who stutter and matched controls. Running the same analysis on the pilot data gives the statistically significant result that VAMP amplitude is 10.1 decibels smaller in people who stutter, similar to the main study. These decibel differences suggest that people who stutter are experiencing the vestibular component of their own speech with about half the intensity of those who don't stutter. Well, what does it mean? With this result, we should for now set aside the null hypothesis and continue to research the idea that vestibular response differs between participants who stutter and controls. The result is consistent with the only prior research on the vestibular system in stuttering, which showed that evoked nystagmus during speech is more pronounced in participants who stutter than in controls. H1 and H2 are both supported by the available data. We can draw a few conclusions. First is that own speech is likely to be identified in the brainstem. Groups of neurons supporting coincidence detection on the millisecond time scales required can be found in the cochlean nucleus and superior olivary complex. These are initial stages in the subcortical chain referred to as the ascending auditory pathway. Changes in neural firing rates along that pathway following the coincidence detection proposed in H1 would correspond to an own voice auditory stream. This is the same auditory stream required by speech motor models. The feedback control of vocalization as described at the beginning of this talk. This creates a problem for speech motor research. A physiologically valid own speech stimulus must contain both air conducted sound and body conducted vibration. However, speech motor research into own voice has been carried out solely using air conducted sound. Typically, the output level is increased by 10 decibels or so to account for the missing body conducted vibration. But this just won't work because the air conducted sound remains below vestibular threshold. Vestibular mechanoreceptors will not be deflected and own voice will not be identified as an auditory stream in the brainstem according to H1. As a result, conclusions drawn from speech motor research are not as strong as they might appear to be. For example, a consistent finding in many experiments is that parts of temporal cortex which respond to sound have reduced activity when participants vocalise in comparison to when participants hear playback of their vocalisation. This has been interpreted as speech motor activity modulating the temporal cortex and is sometimes called speech induced suppression. But the conclusion is invalid. An alternative explanation is that the observed reduction in temporal cortex activity is due to the difference in stimuli between the vocalization condition and the playback condition. Of course, it's possible that both explanations are correct, 
that an own voice auditory stream modifies temporal cortex activity and that art articulation modifies temporal cortex activity independently of audition. The point is, we don't know from the data currently available. Exploring physiologically valid speech stimuli, that is stimuli with coincident air conducted sound and body conducted vibration, offers the opportunity to increase the explanatory power of speech motor models. For example, several authors have proposed that a difference in speech induced suppression between those who do and don't stutter underlies the observed stuttering behavior. In direct tests, these proposals received indifferent support, but the tests used vocalization versus air conducted playback comparisons, which are not physiologically valid. As a result, the proposal that moderation of temporal cortex by speech motor activity differs between people who do and don't stutter remains live. It's one of the possibilities for H1 and H2 when applied to a feedback control model. As well as the overlap between auditory and vestibular nuclei in the ascending auditory pathway, there is an overlap between cortical areas important for speech and language and those with connections to the vestibular system. However, this overlap has received little investigation. In addition, cerebellar vermis receives direct innovation from the vestibular periphery. This innovation could be important for persistent developmental stuttering, since both trait and state comparisons in stuttering show differences to controls in activation levels of cerebellar vermis. I've talked mainly about H1 today, but in conclusion, I wanted to briefly touch on H2, the proposal that people who stutter misidentify their own speech. I actually developed this before H1. I wanted to explain why altered auditory feedback is effective in reducing stuttering and also why stuttering has word and situational level variation. I don't have scope to detail the whole of H2 here, but in essence, it's an update of Sheen's account of stuttering as approach avoidance conflict. A few things come out of the update. Firstly, Contemporary accounts of approach avoidance place the associated brain activity in prefrontal cortex, whereas the conflict for stuttering would manifest as go and no-go activity in basal ganglia. Both prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia have repeatedly been identified as important in persistent developmental stuttering. When considered alongside the cortical areas related to speech motor and auditory activity, which were described earlier in this talk, it appears that an account of stuttering, which includes vestibular activity, has potential to bring together otherwise disparate threads in stuttering research. And perhaps it can do even more besides. Individual stuttered instances can be viewed as data. H2 provides a framework for investigating those word level and situational data to provide a psycholinguistic account of stuttering with an accompanying neural basis. Integrating speech motor and psycholinguistic accounts of brain activity is a major challenge for contemporary research. Stuttering may be an ideal condition to study in order to achieve such integration. Okay, so um, I would like to invite um, Max, I guess, to the um, platform, if you can, if you're there and you can turn, oh, there you are, okay. Um, so do we have any questions at all from the audience? It's a stunned silence. I'm sorry, what? Um, it's a stunned silence, I hope. Well, you know, I do have a question, if I may ask, uh, and I apologize if I, uh, you already answered this question, uh, if I didn't get it from the beginning of your talk, but um, why was it that you chose uh, stuttering um, as an area to look at that vestibular response? Um, it's actually happened all the other way around. So I'm a person who stutters, 
And when I was looking for explanations of stuttering, um, I realized it would be necessary to explain why the autodidactic feedback is effective. So I came up with an explanation incorporating that. And I then realized um, that if my explanation was correct, people who stutter would have to perceive their own speech in a different way to people who don't stutter. So at that point, I went down to the library thinking, I'll just look at how people perceive their own speech, because that must have already been done. And whatever that is, I'll run the test on people who don't stutter. Um, in fact, no one had done any research on that. So I had to come up with a whole second hypothesis for that. And then eventually I did run that study and there is a difference. Um, so I have two hypotheses now. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, so do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, here we go. Um, let's see. Oops, hold on here. Oh, the question disappeared. Um, hmm. bottom, um, I, is this the response related to middle ear muscle I'm sorry, sorry, Carly, I can't understand you. What did you say? I, I think the question just went down to the bottom. I think it was um, this vestibular response related to middle ear muscle reflex. Yeah, so um, this is a question about the tedious and the pitch of timpani. Um, there was a bit of research done on this in the 80s. I think Pete Howell has a paper about the Tantra There's been people looking at Mr. Pedius as well. I had a look at that because that was the initial thought I had. Um, it did, there's, there's nothing much happening for people who are to there um, on the basis of the research that's been done to date. And it's not compelling, really, but the vestibular system is really compelling. Um, it looks like before you even test it, and um, I I get a really strong results and I test that. It, it, it does need replication. It would be great if anyone wants to replicate it. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. So uh, with that, I guess we will move on to our next uh, presentation, um, which is um, from uh, Mindy uh, Bakhtigar and uh, Kurt Egger, uh, is that exogenous response inhibition in adults who start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my talk. My topic is about exogenous response, vocal response inhibition in uh, adults who start. I would like to acknowledge my collaborator, Professor, Professor Kurt Eggers uh, from Thomas More University College. I would like also to acknowledge my uh, uh, faculty at, at Hong Kong Polytechnic University for providing this uh, generous uh, grant support for conducting this research. So what is response inhibition at first? Response inhibition is usually re related to the ability to suppress a pre-planned, habitual, or pre-potent response. Although response inhibition is uh, usually uh, sometimes referred to stopping a motor response, but it also re it reflects a set of uh, related response control processes that could also include attending or interpreting some stimuli, making decision uh, based on these stimuli and also based on the internal external cues, uh, response selection process and executions of the appropriate motor response. Uh, some studies actually suggest a connection between studying and impaired response inhibition. The uh, initial report for this connection come from a parental report survey indicating that children who stutter have lower scores on inhibitory control and attentional shifting. There are a few behavioral paradigms that uh, um, are commonly used to assess response inhibition, um, uh, such as go-no-go task and stop signal task. The go-no-go task actually required the participant to respond quickly to a more frequently items uh, and refrain 
from uh, responding to a less frequently presented items. This paradigm basically stresses more on correctness in, instead of what efficiency of the responses. Children who, and adults who stutter who uh, um, like were tested under these paradigms are showing that they have more difficulty to inhibit manual responses in reaction to the no-go signals compared to the fluent speakers. Another paradigm for assessment of inhibitory control is a stop signal task. So in this uh, task, usually the person needs to stop an already initiated response by presence of a go signal in reaction to the presence of a, a stop signal. It is believed that a stop signal task is more suitable for assessment of motor response inhibition because it requires the inhibition of a motor response that has already initiated. However, the go no -go task uh, require inhibition of motor response that may not be necessarily initiated. The behavioral studies that use this paradigm, uh, I mean, SSD, uh, stop signal task, in, adult, in people who stutter is basically uh, were focusing on manual response inhibition. Uh, however, the results also were controversial when different age group has been tested. For example, some studies that use this paradigm among the adult who stutters they found that adults who stutter have longer stop signal reaction time. So that means that they were slower to uphold or withhold and already started motor commands. However, uh, the other studies that use the same paradigm to test children uh, who stutter the find no group uh, differences. Okay, so Looking at the previous studies, uh, basically uh, um, uh, what we can uh, refer and imply is that they basically uh, measure the manual response inhibition in children and adults who stutter. However, as we know, stuttering is speech uh, production deficits. Uh, and despite this fact, the speech motor inhibition is understudied in this uh, area. And also the study that used manual response inhibition is more or less controversial. And the studies also use this paradigm wrong. People who stutter is basically focused on Western languages. And there are not many studies looking at the, uh, to the best of our knowledge, no studies looking at response inhibition in like tonal languages, like Chinese languages um, uh, that have a different, uh, you know, uh, uh, language, um, that coming from a different language family. So in, in this study, we basically were interested to examine the vocal response inhibition in adults who stutter among native Cantonese speakers um, who speak like Chinese, uh, one of the um, uh, languages under the Chinese um, family, language families. So just a brief uh, introduction about Cantonese. Uh, Cantonese is tonal language and systematically distinguishes uh, the meanings uh, based on the pitch patterns uh, in addition to the other segmental distinctions such as the phonemes. So in Cantonese, there are six different tones, including high level, mid rising, mid level, low falling, low rising, and low level. And changes in these lexical tones can, base, can, ref, can uh, change the lexical meaning as well. Okay, in this study, we uh, tested 13 adults who stutter and 14 adults who do not stutter. And our stimuli were six in Chinese characters that were representing the six lexical terms. So these uh, words basically were all semi-vowels uh, and they only differ in the lexical tones um, um, that we can hear today. So. These are like the uh, yi sound, which can, uh, which when produced under different lexical tones, the meaning could change. Yi. This is the first one, first tone. Yi. Second tone. Yi. Third tone. Yi. Fourth. Yi. Five and. Six tone. Okay. So these are the tones that we were uh, used, uh, but we used the characters. So the people has to 
basically read them. So now we closing them again. Thank you. All right. Um, so, so the people, um, the participant needs to uh, uh, read these characters that we're uh, presenting across different condition, including the go signal trials, stop signal trials, and ignore signal trials. So in this uh, go trials, basically the character will appear uh, under uh, uh, inside uh, inside the queen borders. However, for stop signal trials and ignore trials, they also were similar to go trials, but with, the, with this difference that after a delay, uh, after a delay, the green border changed to a red border for stop signals, signaling to stop response, and to blue border, signaling to continue response, uh, respectively. And the participants were asked to read them as fast as possible during the go signal and ignore signal trials and refrain from uh, reading or naming them uh, during the stop signal trials. And there were uh, a delay between the appearance of like the go signal uh, and stop signal, which is called the stop signal delay. And it was varied across the trials depending on the client performance. So when the client's doing a good job in uh, uh, successfully stopping the trials, uh, the SSD was increased to make uh, the next trial more difficult. And if they were doing poorly in the particular trials, the SSD decreased to increase the chance of successfulness in the next trial. We use linear mixed effects modeling for analysis um, uh, of the results. Our dependent variables were reaction times across go trials, ignore trials, and stop signal reaction times. So un unlike the go trials and ignore trials, uh, there is no direct measure for stop signal uh, trials because when the person is successfully stopped uh, a response, uh, there is no uh, uh, reaction times recorded actually. Um, however, there are some established uh, methods for uh, calculating the SSRT that we followed previous studies such as Market et al. and Logons et al. And, uh, and we're basically we're calculating the um, uh, stop signal reaction times according to the uh, distribution of the go trials, uh, reactions of the go trials, and the uh, the amount of like uh, stop errors. So I don't go into details of that. I can refer you to the paper by Mark and all. Okay, so we put like both fixed fixed effects and fixed factors and also the random factors uh, to build a, a strong model. We're interested to look at the group effect and conditions and, and especially the two-way interaction between them. Okay, now tapping into the uh, results. So looking at the main effects and main uh, um, findings first. So overall, we found that adults who stutter were uh, slower um, than adults who did not stutter. And the difference, although we're um, uh, uh, close, but it, it tends to be significant. Another main effect that we found is that the uh, reaction times for stop signal RTs were um, slower than, sorry, were faster than the ignore RT and the go RTs. So that's also interesting to see that, uh, to indicating that for a person to be able to uh, uh, successfully with how they need to come up with this decision of stopping uh, the way um, earlier than they decide to, uh, to finalize their responses uh, in go trials and ignore trials. Um, however, in terms of the interactions, so we didn't find any differences um, uh, between the groups. Uh, adults who stutter showed comparable performance with uh, uh, adults who do not stutter in terms of go trials and, and ignore trials. In terms of the stop signal RDs, uh, uh, that uh, basically is uh, uh, a measure that is uh, more of interest to our study. Uh, although we find that numerically start, adults who start with slower than typically fluent uh, adults, but the difference were not turns out to be significant between the two groups. And we also look at the stop signal accuracy. 
and we found that uh, uh, basically adults do not stutter were um, uh, slower uh, or uh, less accurate than adults would not stutter, but then the differences still were not significant. Uh, in terms of the, we also look at the uh, reaction times of failed stop trials. So the stop trials that they were not able to withhold this response. And uh, although we found that the uh, uh, adults who started were faster in making immature responses, so uh, they were more like impulsive to give a response. However, again, the difference didn't turn out too significant. You can see that the confidence bar are overlapping between the two groups. Okay, so to summarize, we can tell that the results showed a similar performance across the two groups in terms of the vocal response, uh, vocal reaction times in gold trials and ignore trials. In terms of the stop trials, we found that uh, the adults who stutter were slower and they were also less accurate than adults who do not stutter to successfully withhold the vocal response in reaction to the stop signal. However, the difference were not statistically significant. So based on this result, current result, we, we can tell that these preliminary findings may not completely support a robust deficit um, in vocal response inhibition in adults who stutter, which may not be in line in the previous studies that uh, test manual response inhibition in adults who stutter. Uh, the differences could be like referred to the, in probably some of the uh, the controversy might be referred to some of the differences between the studies. So in this study, we use the vocal response inhibition, as I discussed, but previous studies use manual response inhibition. Uh, that might be one of the reasons. Um, another difference is that the stop signal cue that we use here were, uh, was visual, um, so changing the color of the borders. But other studies in adults will use stop signal uh, uh, vocal, uh, the auditory stop signals. Um, so, and we know that there are differences in terms of the processing of the visual stimuli versus the auditory stimuli. And the last but not least, probably the differences could be also um, explained in terms of the sample size. We only have like 13 people, 13, 14 people in each groups. Um, uh, um, there is possibility that when increasing sample size, there might be some differences. Um, uh, however, given this finding that we have, uh, we can tell that uh, our study is more in line with the recent study that uh, uh, showing that the ex externally triggered response inhibition is in hand in children who stutter. And so we also provided this uh, similar results in adults who stutter. And uh, this may support the hypothesis that people who stutter may have more problem in endogenously triggered response inhibition, uh, while the exogenously triggered response inhibition might be better preserved. However, uh, further studies, like I mentioned, for different manipulation of experiments and sample size will need uh, to be done in future to uh, verify this hypothesis and to see our result uh, will still the same or not. Thanks a lot for your attention and I was looking forward to further comments and questions and discussion. Thanks a lot. Okay, so if I could invite um, um, Mindy, if you want, oh, there we are. Okay, all right, so we do have uh, one question uh, from the audience. Uh, the question is, uh, I might have missed it, but how are the reaction times measured for stop trials when there are no productions? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, as I also mentioned that, uh, uh, so because in stop trials, there is no direct measure of reaction time. So uh, basically, um, um, so you, uh, the uh, of practice is that and you have you need to calculate that based on the uh, distribution of the uh, the reaction times uh, that are given to the whole trials, and uh, and take it into account the um, uh, the uh, the accuracy uh, of the person's uh, individual person 
for stopping the uh, uh, for successfully stopping the response in the uh, top signal trial. There are some formula I can refer you to the papers uh, by Market et al. and also by uh, Logan. Uh, and so that if you wanted to like uh, know about the exact formula, you can find studies. I hope it's okay. 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 Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, I'll ask you a question then. Um, I was wondering a little bit about, so you put the go trials, the ignore trials, and the stop trials all in your in, in the model for condition. Uh, the go trials, though, you know, to me, it seems like that's really measuring attention, right? Because they're just responding to that go trial. They're not actually inhibiting anything in the go trial. It's only the no go trial where you actually have inhibition, right? And so, uh, and so I guess I was kind of wondering, like, I mean, why, why? So basically, you kind of have attention and inhibition that you're putting in there all at the same time. See what I mean? Uh, so uh, the idea for having both trials and ignore trials is basically uh, to make some, uh, um, you know, um, like uh, what you have in the uh, go no go tasks. So you will have the go go trials and no go trials, right? Because you wanted to like uh, uh, you want to create a prepotent, you know, responses that like the people uh, should make a response. So you want to initiate the motor responses uh, uh, in a way that, okay, if they really all see that like in all of the trials, the green is turned into the red, they can just anticipate, you know, and they can just give a response, uh, like withhold the response until the red is coming on. So that's for uh, motivating the persons to be able to uh, like the start their motor response as fast as possible and initiate that. And then, and we present the go, uh, stop trials so that like halfway through or near to the like final executions, they realize that now they, they need to stop the responses. So I think the uh, existence of those like goal signals uh, are necessary. Uh, and of course, I agree with you, attention is also there, you know, as I mentioned, uh, response inhibition is not only about the inhibiting the motor response, but also is include like attention, decision making, and yeah, and I think their whole package is there. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I understand why the GO trials are there. I mean, you have to establish that potent response, but uh, I just have always kind of wondered why, you know, when you're measuring their performance on the go part of a task, I think you're really just measuring attention there. It's, and it's really just that no-go trial where you're actually tapping into inhibition. But maybe maybe I'm not making sense, but um, in any event. Uh, but I guess like attention is also involved in all of the trials, right? In ignore trials and also in stop trials. So uh a probably different type of attention is uh involved in that if i'm if i'm right like sustained attention versus you know like uh maybe some sort of like different type of attention selective attention i would say or reactive uh yeah okay all right so do we have any uh, other sorry, questions sorry. from the audience Okay, so, um, all right, so I guess with that, then we will move on to our final uh, presentation of this section, which is uh, a presentation by Amanda Hampton Ray and colleagues on the neuromarkers of selective auditory attention in uh, childhood stuttering.
Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our talk today. I'm Mandy Hampton Ray from the University of Pittsburgh, an assistant professor in communication science and disorders. And today I'd like to talk to you about our study, the neural markers of selective auditory attention in childhood stuttering. To begin with, um, some of our financial disclosures include that this work was funded by a grant from the National Institutes of Health and the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Michigan, as well as some internal funding from Michigan State University. We do not have any non-financial disclosures. As many of you are likely familiar, developmental stuttering is a neurodevelopmental disorder with onset beginning typically between two and four years of age. Approximately 5% of children would develop stuttering. And of these children, between 75 and 80% of children will go on to recover, while about 20 to 25% of children will develop persistent stuttering. Stuttering is a multifactorial and dynamic disorder, meaning that rapid changes across multiple cognitive systems interact in an individual child, contributing both to the onset and the persistence of stuttering. Cognitive systems widely believed to play a role in stuttering include speech motor control, emotion or emotional regulation, temperament, language, and other aspects of cognition, including working memory and attention. The study I'm talking about today focuses on attention. Several studies over the past few years have suggested differences in attention and attentional control between children who stutter and children who do not stutter. Several studies, including parental reports of attention and inhibition skills have shown differences between children who stutter and children who do not stutter. Some behavioral studies have found reduced orienting and shifting of attention in children who stutter compared to children who do not stutter. And a neurophysiological study using a pure tone oddball task found less efficient auditory attention and working memory updating in children who stutter compared to children who do not stutter. Recent studies have also shown reduced response inhibition in children who stutter, though there have been other studies looking at inhibition skills that have found no differences. And some of these contradictory findings may be related to both age and task differences between studies. A recent functional neuroimaging study found aberrant connectivity patterns between both dorsal and ventral attention networks and the somatomotor network, as well as the default mode network in children who stutter, patterns that were not observed in children who do not stutter. And these differences were most pronounced for children who eventually persisted in stuttering. So together with behavioral and parental report findings, these findings suggest that there may be some differences in attentional control and the underlying neurophysiological processes supporting attentional control in children who stutter compared to children who do not stutter. Previous studies, both in behavior and neurophysiology, have focused on relatively brief segments of speech or even non-speech sounds, but deficits in selective attention might influence the neural encoding of continuous speech, which would be most difficult in natural listening conditions. Therefore, it's important to employ paradigms that reflect more complex listening environments that children might encounter in the real world. Um, and that is what we have aimed to do in this current study. So our research question is, do neural mechanisms underlying selective auditory attention differ between children who stutter and children who do not stutter? Selective attention is a skill that we talk about often as a, using a spotlight metaphor. So you can focus your attention on one stream of information while actively ignoring surrounding streams of information. So this is the prime example of the cocktail party effect. You're able to focus your attention in on your target speaker and ignore all the other speakers in the room so that you can engage in a conversation. This is the type of skill that we're looking at in this study. In order to do that, we've employed electroencephalography or EEG. EEG is a measure of electrical activity generated by populations of neurons firing in synchrony. And that electrical activity is recorded at the level of the scalp by electrodes that we place on the scalp. Um, for event-related brain potentials, we can time lock that EEG signal to specific stimuli and then average many trials together to get a better signal to noise ratio and be able to see a reliable neurophysiological response. 
these electrical potentials from um, the electrodes get amplified and recorded. And then we're later able to use these recordings for processing and then data analysis. So the current study had 43 children aged five to eight years, 23 children who stutter, and 20 children who do not stutter. These groups were matched on performance on nonverbal IQ using the primary test of nonverbal intelligence, receptive language skills using the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals, fifth edition, and on both consonant and phonological productions using the Banks and Bernthal test of phonology. Here's an example of the paradigm that children heard while they were sitting in the booth um, listening to these stimuli. And you can see they're seated in a chair, they're looking straight ahead at a monitor, and they're sitting equidistant between two speakers. And there's a research assistant in the room with them to help keep children engaged, to answer any questions, and to help them pay attention to um, what we want them to listen to. Lily and the lady next door. Lily was a white dog with black spots. He was her very own kangaroo. Sometimes when Lily was very naughty, she would say, "Hey, Fox, you blue kangaroo." The lady next door sang. She sang high and loud. One day, Lily decided to give all her dolls a bath. She filled the kitchen sink with soapy water and gave them a good scrub. Then she went to get a towel. She said, "Wow, the room was so hot. The water was ever coming." So as you may be able to hear, there's a lot going on in this paradigm. So what we have is a story coming in from the left speaker and a story coming in from the right speaker. And children are told to attend to one of these stories and just ignore everything else that they hear. So in this example, they would be attending to the story coming from the right speaker. On the computer in front of them is an image or a series of images associated with that story, as well as an arrow pointing towards that speaker to help them remember which story to listen to. Overlaid on both the story that they're supposed to listen to or the attended story, as well as on the ignore story, are a series of probes. And these are the probes for which we've time-locked the EEG to elicit event-related potentials. These um, are, uh, there are two probes, a ba probe, which we call our linguistic probe, and a buzz like ch ch kind of sound, which is a spectrally and temporally rotated version of that BA, which we call our non-linguistic probe. So when we're looking at event-related brain potentials, what we can see um, are responses like these here down below. So here we have time on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. We can see for both the BA linguistic syllable and the non-linguistic syllable or sound, we see a larger response um, when children are attending to that stream compared to when they're ignoring that stream. So we have BAS from the attended story and BAS overlaid on the ignored story, and we compare the two. We see a larger amplitude response for both BAS and buzzes. Here's BAS and here's buzzes. The response is larger when you're attending to the side that the probe was on compared to when you're ignoring that side. So we see these patterns in adolescents and adults, and we see them in children as young as three years of age. When we looked at the ERPs elicited by these probes um, for both children who stutter and children who do not stutter, what we saw was for the BA linguistic stimuli, an overall larger response for both attended and unattended syllables in the children who do not stutter compared to the children who stutter. So we can see that here in this yellow time window as well. So for both, there's not a condition interaction. For across both conditions, there's a larger negative response, negative here is plotted upward, a larger negative response for the children who don't stutter compared to the children who stutter in this later time window. And we didn't see any differences in the non-linguistic business condition between groups. Um, this later negativity is a, an emerging event potential, event related potential in this age range of five to eight years. And so seeing this potential in the children who do not stutter compared to the children who stutter may suggest earlier maturation of this um, negativity in response to rapid linguistic stimuli in this complex environment in children who do not stutter compared to children who stutter. Um, but we did not see any differences 
in the waveforms elicited by the non-linguistic stimulus. The later negativity emerges at a later age for the non-linguistic stimuli, and that may be one of the reasons why we're not seeing a maturational difference in this age where we wouldn't expect to see that potential yet. So the other thing we're able to do with this paradigm is to look at cortical tracking of the auditory story. So kind of setting aside the probes for a minute and looking at how the brain responds to that continuous story, one that the child was attending to and one that the child was ignoring. Cortical tracking is a way of measuring how well the neural activity entrains to the temporal envelope or the envelope of the, the speech envelope of the story. And cortical tracking has um, now been studied for about um, six or seven years and is believed to reflect things like tracking the envelope characteristics or identifying the onsets of words and phrases, how well the brain tracks specific features of speech sounds, things like voicing, place and manner of articulation, whether it's a consonant or a vowel, et cetera, um, and or how well the brain is parsing a continuous speech into separate syllables. So we were looking at the continuous stories and the probes and how they elicited event-related potentials. But when we're looking at um, cortical tracking, what we're doing is taking the temporal envelope of each story and um, then deriving that envelope and then estimating how well, using machine learning approaches, how well the EEG maps onto that um, envelope of the story. And the similarity between the speech envelope and the uh, temporal response function of the TRF is estimated as a correlation, and that's our cortical tracking measure. So stronger correlations reflect better tracking of the story by um, the by the brain in these temporal response functions. So when we looked at our tended stories compared to our ignored stories. Um, what we found is that all children have better cortical tracking for the attended stories compared to the ignored stories. Um, but the children who do not stutter are showing better cortical tracking for the attended stories compared to the children who do not stutter. Both groups were showing similar magnitude of cortical tracking for the stories that they were ignoring. So when children are selectively attending to a story in this complex speech environment, children who stutter are less effective at encoding the envelope of this continuous speech. And it may suggest less effective encoding of rapid changes in speech streams that we're capturing in this attention process. So we know that complex speech environments require attention, and there appears to be a dysregulation in speech perception when children are needing to attend to a specific speech stream. This does not appear to be a bottom-up acoustic sensory issue because speech perception for the non, the unattended or passive condition is comparable between both groups of children. However, more research is needed to determine the underlying causes of these differences in speech envelope encoding. So to put this all together, in complex listening environments, children who stutter showed a less mature neural processing pattern for syllable encoding compared to children who do not stutter, but this did not differ as a function of attention. They also showed less efficient cortical tracking when they're attending to a continuous auditory speech stream compared to children who do not stutter in the presence of competing speech. And these patterns may suggest differences in higher order cognitive processes that support, support speech perception in complex listening environments. All of this work happens with an amazing team of researchers. So I'd like to thank our collaborators at the Michigan State University Developmental Stuttering Project, um, all of the people in my brain systems for language lab, both at Michigan State and at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as the members of the Sound Brain Lab at the University of Pittsburgh for all their um, work on this project. Thank you for listening. Um, Julie, you're muted. Can you hear me, Julie?
Julie, we can't hear you at the moment. Could you just try refreshing your screen? Um, Julie, we still don't hear you, unfortunately. Could you just try refreshing your browser and see if that kicks into action? Okay, can you see me now? We can hear you and see you perfectly. Okay, okay, sorry about that. I didn't, uh, I wasn't sure who you were directing that to, but um, okay, so we do have a question for you, uh, and that is, uh, could you clarify why you are ruling out bottom-up processing deficits for uh, CWS when there are syllable ba differences? Um, sure, so, oh, sorry. Um, one of the things that we're thinking is that because this um, task is only a complex listening environment, um, it's um, difficult for us to say exactly what would happen in a quiet environment looking at um, uh, syllables. Um, there are um, hypotheses given the cortical tracking combined with the syllable data is that the um, attentional processes that are involved in this, um, in in completing this task, uh, are at play in both the syllable processing and the cortical tracking of the stories, um, and so that um, attentional component um, seems to um, be uh, where some of the big differences are lying. Though um, it's a good point that we can't rule out um, any bottom-up processing difficulties in children who stutter from this paradigm alone. Though in combination with some other studies um, that have looked at um, speech sound processing in quiet or in simpler environments um, that, that don't always show deficits or differences in speech sound processing of syllables, um, our hypothesis is that these differences are about the complex environment and attention more so than auditory or acoustic processes. But we would need to do more um, studies to confirm that, of course. Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay. All right. Well, our time is up uh, anyhow. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mandy, for your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Very nice job. So, all right. Thank you, everyone.